from the studios of Warren Tech North. This is Building Bright Futures, a Jeffco podcast with Jeffco Superintendent Dan McMenemy. I'm Dan McMenemy, and I want to thank you for investing the time to learn about one of the largest public school systems in Colorado and the country. Today, our focus is on the important job of security in our schools. My guest is John McDonald, Executive Director for Security and Emergency Management Department for Jeffco. Welcome, John. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, let's start with your history, John. How long have you been in this position, and what did you do before you came to Jeffco? I've been here almost eight years now, and uh, prior to Jeffco, I was uh, a soldier for seven years, a police officer for a short time, and worked as a director of security and U.S. investigations for a global Fortune 100 company. That's quite a background. Give us a sense of your responsibilities and what a typical day might look like. Well, we have 86,000 students in Jeffco, roughly, uh, another 13,000 employees. Uh, at any one time, we have up to 10,000 visitors or volunteers in our school district. So Jeffco is really a city unto itself, and the Security and Emergency Management Department is charged with protecting all students, staff, and visitors, and we do that uh, through patrol operations. We do that through emergency training drills of schools. We um, have an emergency dispatch center that last year handled just under 46,000 calls. So it's a very robust department. We're very active. We do everything from searching for missing kids to uh, responding to threats to answering safe to tell calls on students in crisis, whether it's bullying concern or um, maybe it's somebody cheating on a test. Maybe it's something more serious. But each one of those calls that comes in from our kids is treated with fidelity, and and we're very aggressive in, in responding and investigating to make sure our kids are protected. We work with eight law enforcement agencies and uh, 15 fire jurisdictions in Jeffco uh, in three counties. So it's really a complex job, not only the prevention and intervention aspect where you're you're doing the staff development piece, but also the response to security concerns or, you know, just taking care of business to make sure that we have the safest schools in America. We, we sure try, and, and it's really important. I mean, for us, we understand the importance that uh, education and safe schools play, and a, a child can't be educated if they don't feel safe in their environment. So our first charge is making sure that when they're in school, they feel safe in that environment because we know safe kids are better learners. They have higher test scores, better graduation rates. So there's a cause and effect. John, one of the things that I am most proud of is the work that you do around protocols that are standard in our district. And now these protocols have also served as models in many other school districts. Um, for instance, when I was in another district, we always would ask, what's Jeffco doing um, when we were trying to put together our protocols and plans and knew you to be a leader in that? Can you give us a few examples of some of the protocols and procedures that you've put in place in our district that others have said, that's good stuff, we're taking that? Well, I think uh, two that really come to mind. The first is the standard response protocol that was developed by the I Love You Guys Foundation. Uh, John Michael and Ellen Keyes, in the aftermath of, of their tragedy where their daughter Emily was killed at Platte Canyon High School by a gunman, they developed a, f a four protocol system common shared language between students, educators, and law enforcement. And the great thing about that standard response protocol is it, it's so easy to implement. We did it in three weeks for 86,000 students and, and, and 154 schools. And uh, we did it with fidelity, and we saw the benefit the very first year. Uh, because the very first year we implemented we trained the Deer Creek Middle School staff three weeks before we had a school shooting, and they really responded uh, in just a remarkable way. What's happened since then, because we were the very first that implemented it nationwide, um, it really gave, I think, the, the I Love You Guys Foundation the opportunity to say, look what Jeffco is doing. Here's a large organization that's been through trial and fire with Columbine High School tragedy that's adopted this. Since we first adopted it, there are now 15,000 schools across the U.S. and Canada, uh, and even Spain, that have adopted this program. And that's pretty exciting. It's, it's always fun to be on the cutting edge of something that has such meaning and also works so well. 
and it's cheap. Um, the foundation doesn't charge anything for this program, and you don't find high-impact, easy-win solutions in education anymore. Right. So training on these protocols <clears throat> is key, not only for students, but for staff, too, and it's constant. Back in the day when we were in school, you know, the first day of class, you'd talk about, hey, if there's a fire, here's where you go. Nobody ever talked about school shootings or violence no. at schools, none of that. But, you know, you talked about that the very first day of class, and then you were done. That's not the model that we use now. I know no. that you do constant training in all of our schools for all levels, from pre-kindergarten to high school kids. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, and that's the second protocol that we're really excited about. We, we've developed something here that I think is a model program. And following the Sandy Hook tragedy, the White House actually asked uh, asked me to come out and speak to them about what that program is. And, and we believe that the effective training is going into the classroom during a lockdown and having a conversation that's direct and honest, that doesn't scare kids, but gives them strategies for success and survival. It's our opportunity to engage a student during that lockdown drill so that they understand what their options are, what's required, and what strategies are going to lend itself to success for them. And it's really been, uh, for us, uh, a really powerful reminder of the importance of school safety. Um, and we've had to practice lockdowns for real um, several times over the years, and we've had great success with them. Our students. Uh, have really demonstrated how effective this is because when we did the Mo Make Your Voice Heard survey, between uh, middle school and high school students, we saw a 26% increase in students that say, I feel safe in my school. From the time we began that uh, until just a couple years ago, so over the course of about six years, we saw a 26% increase. And that's pretty remarkable what to is? get 87% uh, of your kids say, uh, agreeing on anything. And in the elementary level, it was over 93% students that said they feel safe. So obviously, we've got work to do. Um, we're not resting on that, but we're pretty proud of, of, of that result because that's kids telling us how they feel about their own safety. Well, and you know, it, as a former principal, that's <clears throat> one of the building blocks I always believed in was you have to establish a safe and secure environment before anybody's going to do anything else. They have to feel like they're going to be safe in your school. They have to feel like they know trusted adults they can go talk to. They have to know that people are going to take action when unsafe conditions exist. Um, and if you can do that, you're halfway to the climate and culture that's going to make Absolutely. it successful for kids. Completely agree. There's a very narrow window to work in when dealing with the response to a crisis, and smart, effective decisions are so important. Can you expand on that a bit? Sure. Uh, you know, so much of what we do in a crisis is what's called incident command based, and it's using a tiered approach of management together with first responders to manage a crisis. And it's really staying in your lane and making sure that we're doing the good work that, that we need to be doing. We always say that, that cops own the crime and fire owns the flame. Um, schools own the kids. And we are singularly focused on protecting students and staff and we really do that in that trifecta manner with the first responders law enforcement and fire and we have a team in Jeffco that's FEMA incident command trained we have a remarkable incident commander that and Terry Elliott that has been doing this for years understands the principles of incident command and that allows our team to work directly at the scene with with the fire department and law enforcement to resolve a crisis. But then there's more to it than that, and, that, and that's really the leadership opportunity from you know, your position, um, the big picture, because we still have 153 schools that may not be impacted, and how do you continue to see the ongoing day-to-day -day work uh, of those schools so they're not impacted to the extent that the, the one in crisis is? Um, and that leadership it can't be understated because one crisis can define the success of your school district for about a three to five year period of time. And if it's not managed well, and that really starts at, at that top that superintendent level all the way down to you know, our patrol officers, um, to the crisis mental health people in the schools, then we have, we have an issue because students in crisis um, 
are not good learners. And we try to get them back to stability as fast as possible. In order to get kids back to stability, we've got to get the adults stable first. Yeah. Well, and it also speaks to that that reliance on a building principal to be the first and immediate key point of contact that can make a great decision yeah. immediately. Absolutely. Because you're going to be there eventually, right. and you get there quick. But there's still, I mean, there's a lag time between when the incident's happening and when that building principal has to make a decision and when they would get some support. So It's, it's so true. And, and our principals, we talk to them, look, we'll be there for you. You're never on your own and all alone. But you've got to manage the situation until we get there. That could be five minutes. Or, yeah. You know, it could be 15, 20 minutes. But um, support's coming. But you're right. Their decision-making ability really is a determining fact factor in success or failure. Well, and sometimes you err on the side of taking too much action. Like, you know, you do a sure. lockdown in your building when there's an incident outside because you're not sure where right. the person may be. So you do a lockdown, which is every door, right. as opposed to a lock out, which is just the outside doors. Exactly. And so, you know, I think that's hard sometimes for our communities to understand of, wow, why did you go there so quickly? Well, because we have like 10 seconds to make right. the right decision. That's and right. It, it has to be right 100% of the time. And we're, we're going to err on the side of caution to protect kids. Uh, and, and I, you know, we'll, we'll never apologize for that. Yeah. And I, and I think the Jeffco community in general recognizes oh. and understands that. Um, haven't heard as much pushback here about, you know, taking swift and decisive action about safety and security um, as in some other places I've been. And, and I think. Unfortunately, that's because of the tragedy, but fortunately, we've gotten very good at it because of the, the history here. We'll be back with John after this quick break. This is a test to find out if you know it all when it comes to children. Name one of the leading killers of U.S. children age 1 to 13. What's the best way to protect children in a car crash? At what age and size should a child start using a booster seat? Don't assume you know it all when it comes to car seats for your child. Go to safercar.gov slash the right seat and know for sure. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. We're back with John McDonald, Executive Director of Security and Emergency Planning for Jeffco Public Schools. Threat assessment plays a big part in your work. Talk about that, John. Well... Threat assessment is the opportunity for us to really make some important decisions surrounding the level of threat that uh, a student uh, may be causing to a school. It also allows us to do an early intervention to stop the behavior at the earliest possible moment. Threat assessment also allows us to put safety plans in place and then do case management to follow up to make sure that that student's in a safe place. Threat assessment's really an emerging field within education, but it's it's fast emerging. Um, we are seeing uh, a critical importance and a need to make sure that students in crisis really have the supports at the earliest opportunity. And if they're a threat to others, that's our opportunity to protect the rest of the school. How we do that is really a unified team effort in this county. We use a about a 15-member team that includes the district attorney's office, law enforcement, mental health, um, school district, members from the community that specialize in in either threat management or mental health come together, meet with the parents and the student. We find out what the issue is, and we hold people accountable. We also take decisive action to protect schools. And then we manage the situation long term because it's not enough to do an assessment and say, okay, you were a threat yesterday, but today you're going to be mm -hmm. fine. Uh, we really want to do a long-term case management to ensure that entire time that students in Jeffco, that we know that things are okay. Uh, so we, we take this very seriously because the Secret Service did a study several years ago following Columbine, and they found that... Uh, 81% of all school shooters broadcast their intentions in advance. And over the years, uh, new studies have come out with social media increasing, and there's about a 90 to 92% uh, broadcast or students telling at least one person in advance what they're going to do before it happens. 
Well, we believe the broadcast. If a student says, I'm going to hurt or I'm going to do something, we, we have to believe that. We believe those words, and then we take uh, very decisive action. We bring that team together. We do a building-level threat assessment at the school. The school then brings that to the district and, and says, please help. Um, we don't know what interventions to put in place. And this robust interdisciplinary team really comes together, and we work through the problem, and we find solutions. It's not enough to find a problem. Mm -hmm. You have to identify a solution. So a very solution-based team, um, great resource. And a lot of times what we're hearing from parents is, thank goodness somebody's here to help me. I, I, at the end of my rope, I don't know what to do, where to go. Mm -hmm. So we're providing that resource. Um, and for the student, you know, a lot of times students that, that are making these kind of threats are really struggling themselves with mental health issues. That gives us the ability to support them and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and get life right before there's a crisis. So it's really about trying to identify and manage behaviors that may lead to something more serious. Exactly. So we all have to be in tune with what's going on in classrooms or what's being said on athletic fields or in the hallways and Absolutely. kind of listening to what kids are saying. And then we also have to, in my, my belief system, you have to provide adults in a building that kids feel comfortable going to. Right. That The kid that goes to an adult and says, hey, I'm really worried about Dan. Um, that kid doesn't get the blowback from right. their friend going, hey, what are you doing telling them about me? Exactly. You know, and, and I think that's something that we've we've perfected over time is protecting the anonymity of the person that's giving us information. That's a little bit of the safe to tell model right. that we use. Can you talk a little bit more about safe to tell? Sure. I mean, uh, and, and to your point, every child needs a kind, caring, trusted adult in school that they can go to. That That is our hope. But we also know that there are times that – that that person, that adult, is not always in their life. And we see safe to tells most often in the evenings and late at night when kids are really struggling and they don't know what to do. And most safe to tell reports uh, are kids reporting about their friends in crisis, telling us that their friend needs help. And these kids are spot on. They've identified the behavior. Uh, and, and for the teachers out there, when you're reading a story that a student has written when you're looking at the doodling and, and it becomes more violent. Um, when you hear statements in the classroom that are concerning, we never justify the behavior. You know, we, we bring that forward and we say this is not right because when we start allowing that behavior to occur, we've just created a new norm. Mm -hmm. And that norm of potential violence is just not okay in our world. Safe to tell uh, is operated through the Attorney General's office, a wonderful program that came about after the Columbine tragedy, and it allows students to report anonymously anything that impacts them. And eight years ago, this district had 36 safe to tell reports. This year, we're on track for almost 790 reports by the end of the school year, is what I think we'll pr end up having. That's a remarkable difference, incredible growth mm -hmm. in Safe to Tell. The number one report that we get is suicidal uh, behavior. Um, kids telling us that their friends are suicidal. These kids have saved lives by making a call. Um, the second highest is bullying, and the third is drugs. And these are kids saying, this is not right. I don't want this in my environment. Well, those calls come to the principal, myself, and law enforcement. And we... Together, we do an investigation and determine, is it a school-based policy issue? Is it a law enforcement issue? Where does this fit? And we do interventions. And most of the safe to tells result in intervention and not arrest. And I think that's one of the really positive things about safe to tell It changes behavior. Um, and it, it helps establish those norms and, and protecting students. And the great thing is, Crime stoppers, you know, you call after the fact to get a reward. Mm -hmm. Safe to tell, you call before an event happens to protect your friend. What a great civics lesson that is. Right. So it's really an exciting program. Great. You've developed key relationships with many law enforcement agencies in Colorado as a result of your work, and those relationships are truly important in carrying out the mission of your department. Tell us more about that. Well, we are, we are truly blessed in this district. We've got 35 police officers or sheriff's deputies 
that support schools. Um, the school resource officer program is unbelievable. And, and here's the little known secret is law enforcement picks up the total cost of that program. It's one of the, or one of, I think, one or two districts in the, in the country uh, that, that still happens for, and, and that's remarkable. It, it, I think it speaks to um, the way we respect law enforcement and the way they respect our community and, and the kids and the importance of school safety. And we try to honor law enforcement as much as possible because they don't ask a whole lot from us, but they give us a tremendous amount of resource. And so when, when cops say, can we, or can we have an idea, we try to honor that. We find ways to say yes instead of saying no. Uh, and that that relationship uh, is, is so important. And these cops may be the first um, positive relationship, positive interaction for a lot of these kids that they've ever had in their lives. And it's the ability the ability to build a community policing program. And for, the SRO is like the beat cop of the old days. That would walk the neighborhood. The school is their neighborhood. It's their beat. They know their community. They know these kids. And... Uh, they work with the kids. They mentor them. They they have amazing positive relationships that that lend itself to a safe school environment. Well, they're definitely invaluable to the work that we do. And and again, as a former high school principal, having a police officer in your building full time is very helpful. And not from a standpoint of getting kids in trouble, but in interacting with students and knowing what's going on and preventing some some poor behaviors. And quite honestly, the SROs that I've had during the time I was in buildings, they were just great people. They right. liked being around kids. They exactly. were parents themselves. They had a, a really strong um, feeling of wanting to help the community be uh, preventative instead of reactive. And there's a, there's a different way of talking to high school kids than there is of talking to young adults out Absolutely. on the street. And, and I think that's something that our SROs do really well is how can I be a part of the solution rather than just come in and try to take care of business after the fact. And, and I really appreciate that from my chair. I, I, I do as well, and they're a very solution-based uh, group of people. And, and we have eight agencies that provide us um, school resource officers in high schools and middle schools. And then there's also uh, the community policing aspect where the patrol officers out there adopt a school. They'll adopt one or two different mm -hmm. schools, and they spend a lot of time in those schools during the week. Uh, and, and that really comes from the sheriff and the police chiefs believing in the opportunity for that prevention model, for that, that, that positive relationship building model that I think has been so successful in Jeffco. What's the one thing you want our listeners to take away from this interview today? Well, I, I think that you know, we always say that, that security is everybody's responsibility and, and safety um, at, at school has to be owned by the students. It has to be owned by uh, our teachers. If you want a safe school environment, all you have to do is pick up a phone, um, or write an email, send a text. You can use Safe to Tell. You can call our emergency dispatch center at 303 982 2445. There's any number of ways that we will respond to you and your concerns. And it's important that every child feel safe and welcome in our school district. We do that by, I think, providing an atmosphere and a climate and culture of respect. We don't tolerate uh, behavior that is anything less than that. So uh, our model is truly based on prevention, intervention, response, and when we need to, unfortunately, recovery. And uh, that's another important component of this work is the mental health solutions that, that are so needed in our schools today. Well, John, I just want to say thank you on behalf of all of the citizens of Jeffco Schools and of the county for the great work that you and your team do. We couldn't do the work we do and take kids to the places we take them without the things that you're doing to ensure that they're safe. And your team is a key part of everything that we do in this district. Thank you for joining us for this podcast. Remember, if you have a topic or idea you'd like me to explore, please let me know. Until next time. This has been Building Bright Futures, a Jeffco podcast with Jeffco Superintendent Dan McMenemy. This is a production of Jeffco Public Schools.